chapter nine. It was an eye, or it looked like an eye, clear and bright like the color of the sky, an eye like her own eye, but enormous, a glaring eye. Breathless with fear, she sat up, and the eye blinked. A great fringe of lashes came curving down and flew up again out of sight. Cautiously, Ariadne moved her legs. She would slide noiselessly in among the grass stems and slither away down the bank. Don't move, said a voice, and the voice, like the eye, was enormous, but somehow hushed and hoarse like a surge of wind through the grating on a stormy night in March. Ariadne froze. So this is it, she thought. The worst and most terrible thing of all, I have been seen. Whatever happened to Eglatina will now almost certainly happen to me. There was a pause, and Ariadne, her heart pounding in her ears, heard the breath again, drawn swiftly into the vast lungs. Or, said the voice, whispering still, I shall hit you with my ash stick. Suddenly, Ariadne became calm. Why? she asked. How strange her own voice sounded. Crystal thin and hairball clear. It tinkled in the air. In case, came the surprised whisper at last, you ran toward me quickly through the grass. In case... It went on trembling a little. You came and scratched me with your nasty little hands. Ariadne stared at the eye and held herself quite still. Why? she asked again. And again the word, world tink, word tinkled. Icy cold it sounded this time and needle sharp. Things do, said the voice. I've seen them in India. Ariadne thought of her gazetteer of the world. You're not in India now, she pointed out. Did you come out of the house? Yes, said Ariadne. From whereabouts in the house? Ariadne stared at the eye. I'm not going to tell you, she said at last bravely. Then I'll hit you with my ash stick. All right, said Ariadne. Hit me. I'll pick you up. I'll break you in half. Ariadne stood up. All right, she said, and took two paces forward. There was a sharp gasp and an earthquake in the grass. He spun away from her and sat up a great mountain in, the, in a green jersey. He had fair straight hair and golden eyelashes. Stay where you are, he cried. Ariadne stared at him. So this was the boy? Breathless, she felt, and light with fear. I guess you were about nine, she gasped after a moment. He flushed. Well, you're wrong. I'm ten. He looked down at her, breath breathing deeply. How old are you? Fourteen, said Ariadne. Next June, she added, watching him. There was a silence while Ariadne waited, trembling a little. Can you read? The boy said at last. Of course, said Ariadne. Can't you? No, he stammered. I mean, yes. I mean, I've just come from India. What's that got to do with it? Asked Ariadne. Well, if you're born in India, you're bilingual. And if you're bilingual, you can't read. Not so well. Ariadne stared, at, stared up at him. What a monster, she thought, against the sky. Do you grow out of it? She asked. He moved a little, and she felt the, old cold, the cold flick of his shadow. Oh, yes, he said. It wears off. My sisters were bilingual, but now they aren't. They could read any of those books upstairs in the schoolroom. So could I, said Ariadne quickly, if someone could hold them and turn the pages. I'm not a bit bilingual. I can read anything. Could you read out loud? Of course, said Ariadne. Would you wait here while I run upstairs and get a book now? Well, said Ariadne. She was longing to show off. Then a startled look came in her eye. Oh, she faltered. What's the matter? The boy was standing up now. He towered above her. How many doors are there to this house? She squinted up at him in the bright sunlight. He dropped on one knee. Doors? Outside doors? Yes. Well, there's the front door, the back door, the gun room door, the kitchen door, the scullery door, and the French windows in the drawing room. Well, you see, said Ariadne, my father's in the hall by the front door, working. He, he wouldn't want to be disturbed. Working? said the boy. What at? Getting material, said Ariadne, for a scrubbing brush. Then I'll go in the side door. He began to move away, but turned suddenly and came back to her. He stood a moment as though embarrassed, and then he said, can you fly? No, said Ariadne, surprised. Can you? His face became even redder. Of course not, he said angrily. I'm not a fairy. Well, nor am I, said Ariadne, nor is anybody. I don't believe in them. He looked at her strangely. You don't believe in them? No, said Ariadne. Do you? Of course not. Really, she thought he was a very angry kind of boy. My mother believes in them, she said, trying to appease him. She thinks she even saw one once. It was when she was a girl and lived with her parents behind the sand pile in the potting shed. Potting shed. He squatted down on his heels and she felt his breath on her face. What was it like? She, he asked. About the size of a glowworm with wings like butterfly. And it had a tiny little face, she said, and all alight and moving like sparks and tiny moving hands. 
Its face was changing all the time, she said, smiling and sort of shimmering. It seemed to be talking, she said, very quickly, but she couldn't hear a word. Oh, said the boy, interested. After a moment, he asked, where did it go? It just went, said Arietti. When my mother saw it, it seemed to be caught in a cobweb. It was dark at the time, about five o'clock on a winter's evening, after tea. Oh, he said again, and picked up two petals of cherry blossoms, which he folded together like a sandwich and ate slowly. Supposing, he said, staring past her at the wall of the house, you saw a little man, about as tall as a pencil, with a blue patch in his trousers, halfway up a curtain, carrying a doll's teacup. Would you say it was a fairy? No, said Arietti. I'd say it was my father. Oh, said the boy, thinking this out. Does your father have a blue patch on his trousers? Not in his best power trousers, but he does on his borrowing ones. Oh, said the boy again. He seemed to find it a safe sound, as lawyers do. Are there many people like you? No, said Arietti. None. We're all different. No, I mean as small as you. Arietti laughed. Oh, don't be silly. Surely you don't think there are as many people in the world your size. There are more my size than yours, he retorted. Honestly, began Arietti, helplessly laughing again. Do you really think? I mean, whatever sort of world would it be? Those great chairs. I've seen them. Fancy you had to make chairs that size for everyone. And all the stuff for their clothes, miles and miles of it, tenths of it, and the sewing, and their great houses reaching up so you could hardly see the ceiling, their great beds, the food they eat, great smoking mountains of it, the huge bogs of stew and soup and stuff. Don't you eat soup? Asked the boy. Of course we do, laughed Arietti. My father had an uncle who had a little boat, and he would row to the stock, uh, he rowed round in the stock pot picking up flotsam and judsam. He did bottom fishing, too, for bits of marrow, until the cook got suspicious through finding bent pins in the soup. Once he was nearly shipwrecked on a chunk of submerged shin bone. He lost his oars and the boat sprang a leak, but he flung a line over the pot handle and pulled himself along the rim. But that stock, fathoms of it, and the size of the stock pot, I mean, there wouldn't be enough stuff in the world to go around after a bit. That's why my father says it's a good thing they're dying out. Just a few, my father said. That's all we need to keep us. Otherwise, he says the whole thing gets. Arietta hesitated, trying to remember the world. Word. Exaggerated, he said. What do you mean? Asked the boy to keep us.